From Microbe TV, this is Twin, This Week in Neuroscience, episode number 20, recorded on July 12, 2021. Rack and Yellow, and you're listening to the podcast all about the nervous system. Joining me today from Salt Lake City, Jason Shepard. <laughs> Hi, Vincent. Hi, Ron. How how's, how's it going out there? You got good weather, hot weather? Uh, it's It's been abnormally hot, just like most of the West. Uh, mm. And right now, we've got all the smoke coming in from California, so it's really horrible. Mm. Not good. Yeah. It's been over 100 degrees 14 times already this month. It's like a record. <laughs> also joining me from New York, Timothy Chung. Welcome back. Hello. Hi. Thank you. Nice to be back. Nice and le less hot here in New York. And from Nashville, Vivian Morrison. Hi, guys. Can't believe it's been a month already. Yep. Yep. Pretty soon it's <laughs> yeah, going to be. This year is going time. pretty quickly. Pretty soon it's going to be winter. And then it's going to be summer again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, time flies. July, I can't believe it's July. Yeah, middle of July already. That's the way it is. And Ori uh, can't make it today. He's he's doing uh, the stuff that you have to do when you're an MD, which none of us have to do. Uh, it's, yeah, he's I suck steered a, clear. Suck for, for punishment. The MD <laughs> PhD. I don't know why people do that. <laughs> well, he he does, and he's doing patient stuff too. So it's tough. Yeah. You know? Yeah, no. No, it's not something so I ever. Kudos to those the whole MD do. thing. The whole yeah. MD thing. Why do people do that? <laughs> yes. Just kidding. I, yes. That's, I always ask people because I have a ton of undergrads. You know, half of my virology class, right, wants to go to medical school. And I'm like, are you sure this is what you want to do? Are you sure your parents aren't? Just, you know, for a lot of them, it's parental pressure. Uh, you're going to have a good job, blah, 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 and all that stuff. And I just, you know, I'm sure for many it's wanting to take care of people. But, you know, I never wanted to take care of people. <laughs> Me neither. I discovered that in medical school. Oh, you, were, like, you went oh, to yeah, medical school. school. Yeah, yeah. But, I mean, I didn't have to go through, like, I uh, kind of a theme in my life is I've somehow been in the right place at the right time with the right tools. And so I, like, slipped into Swiss medical school because I'm a Swiss citizen. Mm, right, right. Um, like jumped over the the um, the pre med packed into one year and then yeah I was with patients and was like oh no this is definitely not not for me where are the cells where are the mice <laughs> you know I actually in New Zealand um, when I was uh, going to undergrad we have a six year medical school program so you basically have to decide right out of the high school when there's only two medical schools and I, they concentrate all that pre med into one year. Um, and then they then they have another two years of like just book stuff, and then you only get to the clinical where you just and that's when you realize, oh, I don't like seeing blood or I don't like seeing patients. Um, <laughs> so I started doing that pre med first year, and then I had one elective, and that was a neuro uh, psychology elective that I put down. And after that, I'm like, yeah, mm, I think I just want to learn how the brain works. <laughs> you and I have very similar like. There's a lot of a uh, similar parts of our stories because I had a similar thing, although it happened a little earlier, but yeah. All right. You, let's, to, uh, you really have to care about other people. Let's uh, not that I don't care about people, but I just don't want to. Yeah. Take care you of can them. make a bigger impact if, if, if anything with research, um, but yeah. it's a day to day, right? It's the day to day that um, you have to decide, do I want to interact with sick people every day? Yeah, mm -hmm. exactly. Mm -hmm. No, I think it's uh, takes a special skill. Not, not for me. Anyway, uh, we have a, a paper that um, even was honored by a, a column by Ed Young, right? <laughs> it was, um, yes. Uh, and it's got this fancy uh, title called Representational Drift in Primary Olfactory Cortex. Um, but there's actually a kind of a couple of central themes here that are fascinating, at least to me. Uh, and really, our big big questions in neuroscience. And so, one of one of the main ones is, how does the brain represent the outside world, and um, how does it store information for periods of time so that it can make sense of the outside world? So, learning and memory, big theme, big questions. But even just the basic question of, how does the brain represent sensory experience? 
of course, is fundamental to uh, almost anything that we're trying to understand in neuroscience. And so um, this idea then that that information has to be represented in the cortex or in the brain in some way has been uh, the, one of the biggest questions in neuroscience. Um, and it comes down to this idea that, of course, you want a system. You want a, a system that's able to learn and store information, but be flexible enough so that you can learn again and have a, a, a sort of a balance of this of plasticity versus stability in the brain. Obviously, a system where you have information that's always overwritten, you wouldn't be able to really use that as a as a useful tool to understand the world. So there has, the the brain seems to be constantly in this flux of storing information, having it in a stable way versus, you know, being flexible and being able to, to update it and relearn. Um, and so the, the premise for this paper has sort of long history, which is that we always thought that the brain, the neurons in your brain that are actively firing in, in, um, in you know, some sort of a pattern when you uh, experience something, there has to be a, a, a stable representation. That firing has, to, there has to be something that um, the brain is, you know, constantly using to make sense of the world. So, for example, there's a, we always thought there's a dedicated circuit for specific smells or dedicated circuit for a specific visual um, input. So, if you, know, if you break it down into very small sensory um, information like one smell, we always thought that, well, once, and, and once you experience the smell, um, the same part of the brain is going to light up every time you um, have that, you know, exposure. So that, that was, that's really been assumed. And, um, and so that's, that's why this paper and, and sort of a, a few other papers that have recently come out, now that we have the ability to record directly from from neurons in the brain and a live animal um, repeatedly, seems to suggest that maybe we don't quite understand what the brain is representing because um, there there seems to be there, we, we're finding it hard to find that really stable trace or activity pattern or set of cells that are uh, rock solid each time you have even just a basic sensory. Uh, Q. Um, and so that's kind of why this paper's sort of um, uh, done the rounds. And Ed Yong wrote a, a really good article about it. Uh, Ed Yong's probably my favorite scientific journalist at this point. Um, so, so yeah, so, and this is a, this is a group at uh, Columbia University. First author is uh, Cole, Carl Schoonover. Sarah Ohashi, Richard Axel, and Andrew Fink. And this work is in mice. So obviously that's, <laughs> mice are not humans, um, as we've mentioned many times. But of course, what you can do with mice is stick an electrode, and this is what they've done here, stick an electrode in uh, a specific part of the brain and then chronically record from the same place over and over for a month. And that's what they've done. They've stuck uh, a recording electrode in, some, in the place called the piriform cortex. So it's the part of the cortex that's thought to respond to, to smells. Um, and they've recorded uh, in the same mouse, uh, you know, while it's freely behaving um, and they can, they use some fancy statistics and technical um, new technical, you know, sort of advance in electrode technology to really prove or make sure that the, the recording itself is stable, that they are that they are recording from the same set of neurons that they think they are, because um, that has been one of the biggest sort of challenges is that you can stick an electrode in, but there's slight changes in the the way it moves or um, the detectability of, of the um, sensitivity of the electrode so that you're never really 100% sure that you can record from the same set of neurons. But I think they've done a pretty good job here sort of validating that they are able to record uh, a set of neurons for a, at least a month. 
So that's, you know, that's pretty cool in Jason, itself. Jason, what's the tech here? When you say an electrode, I, I imagine this big thing sticking out. But in fact, it's tiny and the mice can move around with this in. It's cemented in place, right? Yeah, exactly. So, uh, you know, this sort of takes a number of different forms. Um, but essentially, it's a very thin wire that's chronically implanted. And it's, you know, best, you have to make a hole in the skull and you stick the wire down and then you cement it in place. Um, and so the, te the technology that sort of improved it, uh, over the last sort of five to 10 years has been in, um, you know, making the wire so that it's really stable, it's flexible enough to go through the brain tissue, but it's not going to um, move around. And the sensitivity, so some of these new electrodes allow you to also sense um, and if, sense neural activity, electrical activity at different points in the electrode, so you can get different information from, um, let's say, the top layer of the cortex versus the bottom layer and that sort of thing. Is this um, they're all, yeah. wireless they're all or are they wired? Yeah, yeah. I'm wondering if the mice can move around or what. I mean, oftentimes I've seen them they're con that they're not wireless, that they are connected to something that can like move around on like sliders on the top of the cage if it was going to be moving around in a large space. But yeah. yeah this, uh, this one is wired because the mice I had fixed. Right. Um, but there, I have seen on wireless technology out there um, but so that you can record 24 seven in the home cage. But I think it's quite challenging because you've got to, you have to have some way of wirelessly recharge the electro to keep it powered. Um, and then all the radio waves of the wireless can interfere with things as well. Cause it probably makes it a bit more complicated. Yeah. Yeah. So this, in this, in this case is, um, the reason why they also want to do head fixed is they, they're doing single unit recording. So that just means that, um, the wire is thin enough that it's able to basically extract uh, one neuro neuron firing, so a single single unit. Um, even though it's sensing, you know, probably it's probably in, within the vicinity of you know ten to hundred neurons. Um, and there's some sort of fancy uh, software that can sort of break down the different um, neurons, and so they can basically say oh, he has the signature. Of, of neuron one, he has the signature of neuron two with that single unit recording, and then they can come back to the same neurons day after day. It's, it's um, actually really incredible. The, the way they've done it is, is kind of similar to, imagine you have a football stadium full of people and each person is kind of like a neuron. Um, and what you're doing is you're sticking in a really long stick full of microphones and you're trying to pick out individual people and each person is all shouting the same thing because it's just an action potential. So they're shouting the same word. They have slightly different voice. So you can pick out by the voice which person it is. And you just have this like long stick of full of microphones. Um, in their case, they have 32 channels. So it's like 32 different microphones. And they manage to pick out for each stick of 32 microphones, a hundred on average, a hundred neurons. Um, and they can tell them apart across many, many, many different days using very fancy maths and a lot of, you know, algorithmic things. And it's quite convincing. Like you can look at the supplements data and it really seems like they picked out individual neurons and they can track them over days and days and days. Yeah. It is crazy. That, they that can was a that. good analogy. Yeah. That yeah. was really good analogy. I was gonna, well yeah, no, that was great. I was going to say, it's sort of like having a, a, an individual, like a bug under the, the seat, you know, like you're FBI and you're listen, trying to listen to one little conversation in the stadium. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I, I thought of that because uh, on the news this morning, it's all about um, the, there's a football thing going on in England where they lost. And that's right, right. a problem to my head. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sorry for your loss. Uh, <laughs> I, yeah. The English anyway. Uh, yeah. Um. All right, so back to so back to the the paper. So here they're they're investigating smell. So how do specific smells get represented in the brain? Um, and so just a bit of basic anatomy for uh, how how the smell um, sensory system works. Of course, you have uh, the actual neurons in the nose that sense uh, individual smells. Um, what's cool about this 
this, this sort of whole smell system is that it's very stereotyped. So a single receptor in a single neuron will be activated by a specific kind of smell. And then those single neurons uh, project to something called the olfactory bulb, um, where there's something called the glomerulus. So it's just a bunch of neurons that are in a group of um, group and uh, clumped together. They're called nuclei or glomerulus. Uh, and so individual neurons that have the same kind of receptor then project to the same kind of glomerulus or nuclei. So it's very stereotyped. And in, in mice, it's so stereotyped that you could basically label a specific uh, olfactory receptor. And in each mouse, it's exactly the same neuron. It's exactly the same glomerulus. So very stereotyped, very well ordered. But here's where, and then it gets, here where it sort of gets crazy. So um, kind of makes sense that you want to have that, that each receptor is its own, um, you know, individual unit. And basically, uh, the idea though, for the smell is of course that there's never going to be one single smell. So it ha the, the brain has to make sense of it all. Um, but for a scientist, we can take advantage of that and say, okay, well, we know exactly which smell. Uh, can activate a specific receptor. And so the, the the various repertoires of smells that you can use have been well worked out. And so in here, in this uh, particular uh, experiment, they used four or five different smells that they know kind of represent the different kinds of receptors and space and parameters, just so that they, they can really tease out whether there's uh, a commonality between them all. Um, so it's all stereotyped up, up until the olfactory bulb, but then the olfactory bulb uh, sends projections to the cortex, the piriform cortex, and then it's essentially random. Like essentially, from all we can tell, uh, it, the cortex receives input um, in a random way. There's no way that you can go to each animal and say, in the cortex, it's these specific uh, neurons that will always respond to that particular smell. Uh, and that, for me, I'm still sort of really puzzled of why you would go all, to all the trouble of having uh, a very ordered system, and then at some point it totally becomes random. And so I think we're missing something. But or at least, I, uh, you know, whether it's you know we can we can get to the that discussion at the end of the sort of going through the data. Um, and so it's, the idea is that the piriform cortex is reading out the smell. Uh, information coming in from the sensory system. Um, there are, of course, a couple of other areas that the olfactory bulb can project to in the brain. And um, and so the cortex is not just the only one. But for for the purpose of here, we, we the hypothesis was that um, you have one specific smell and it's represented in this piriform cortex. And um, it's probably going to be the same set of neurons, at least in the same animal that responds to that smell each time, that there's a stable representation. So, the, so to set out to, to test that, they put the electrode in that piriform cortex, um, recorded the activity of those neurons, specific neurons over a month in response to the specific smells that they, um, that they identified. And then just ask, well, um, you know, how stable is that representation? How, how does the firing of those neurons change each time they give that same smell to the animal? And the surprising result was that essentially over a month, uh, almost 0% of the neurons had the same uh, response to the smell at, at the beginning versus the end of the, the recordings. And in fact, um, by two weeks uh, of recording, almost all the neurons had, sub had so much drift in the responses that they were essentially completely different from the first recording. Um, so that's, that in itself was really surprising. So, you know, a month isn't that long. Um, and so this, and, and the, this drift for them that they sort of tried to figure out, um, they, you know, they, they had some fancy statistics on trying to sort of at least show that, um, it's not because they've lost neurons or that the, the neurons themselves, um, inherently change their firing patterns. It's really just that each time the animal gets that smell, 
there's just a slightly different number of neurons or different kinds of neurons that end up responding to that smell. But it's still within the piriform cortex, right? It's not going way, way to another place, correct? Uh, yeah, so this, yeah, exactly. So they, they didn't record from other areas. Um, this is just in piriform cortex. Um, so it doesn't discount the idea that perhaps there's an, another part of the brain that's receiving that information and that it's collecting it in a more stable way. Um, but in the, but, you know, this is the main part of the brain that we think is processing this these you know sensory information from the, from the smell and sorry just to clarify um am i right in assuming that they what they're saying is um if you pre- you keep presenting the same smell it's going to activate the same set of uh, olfactory receptors or nasal receptors and that would activate the same set of glomeruli in the olfactory bulb over the month, the glomeruli, which is the first uh, synapse, the first junction, is fixed. It is stereotypical. But then the next one in the cortex is then drifting like crazy. Exactly. And, and so they don't really show that in this paper, but there's been a ton of work uh, showing that the representation in, in the, um, you know, the olfactory receptor neurons as well as the glomeruli very very stereotyped you could come back and it's always the same so where does the where does the drift start to occur does it happen like um in terms of like how those glomerular neurons are firing does their pattern change and then that leads to something further out in the network that they pick up is that they're saying is drift or or is it, or is the drift occurring like only in the piriform cortex? I don't really know if that think, makes sense. I think the assumption is that the, the glomeruli will respond essentially exactly the same, the same every single way. time. Every yeah. Time. yeah. So and it that, is yeah. almost like the retina, so to speak. Mm-hmm. It's exactly. like going to be the same response. And then for whatever reasons, then something occurring between the synapse, between the glomerulus, and the piriform cortex is what's causing all this drift to occur. Okay. So, yeah. And so this is, you know, it's, it, it's surprising because um, this is a basic sensory uh, input that you'd expect the brain should be able to figure out, you know, each time. So it's not like when I smell a banana, I think of an apple, you know, just because I haven't experienced the smell of a banana recently. So not, not only that, but like, Anecdotally, the sm- the smell memory is supposed to be the longest, la- like the most uh, long-lasting okay. memory. So ironic. No? Is that is that wrong? But but this is not memory, right? So this is just saying mm, this is um, just activation. how is the informa- sensory information represented? But then that's the next question: was okay. Well, what if we associate the smell with something so that we're at the animal is actually undergoing some sort of learning? So that's the next experiment they d- they did. So they did a, a classic uh, conditioning experiment where they have a shock that they condition in a specific uh, context with one of those smells. And so then afterwards, the animal, if you give them the smell without the shock, they freeze because they think, oh, I'm going to get a shock, right? So they've learned that association. And that's a really strong association, even in mice. It's like one trial learning, you give them a shock with that particular kind of smell and they remember that for months and and same with humans really i mean if you if i shocked you you'd probably (laughs) remember a smell that's associated with if it's really strong um and even in that case so the expectation was okay well maybe the drift is normal um and there's just multiple ways to make sense of that sensory information in the cortex but if you learn to associate that that particular smell with something that's important, like you know, you're in danger. That must have more of a stable representation, and no difference, no difference. So it was they when they recorded from the piriform cortex, uh, and in that context, no change to the smell that had been conditioned um, to the shock. Um, now, of course, again. It's not to say that there could be other parts of the brain, like the amygdala, um, that would really uh, have more of a stable representation of that learning. 
Um, but it didn't do anything to the sensory representation, uh, which again was was really surprising. Uh, so sorry, just to <clears throat> just to clarify, it means after one month, the piriform cortex has drifted way out of sight, and it's no longer the as far as the piriform cortex is concerned, it doesn't look like the same stimulus. But the mouse was able to remember it and freeze. Right. Is right. there any explanation to that? Is there? Is there like is the piriform uh, cortex even needed for smell? For like if you if you inhibit piriform cortex, because they they're still recording within piriform cortex, and they just show that different groups of cells are now firing. Um, but they haven't right. shown that the piriform cortex as a whole is required for either discriminating smell or remembering smell. And right. I actually don't, have no idea whether... Well, like, I mean, the there, there have smell? been experiments that have done that, and it is, you, you really do need the piriform cortex to interpret that, that smell uh, information. But um, really what it comes down to is this idea, and it's actually similar to sort of the, one of the main ideas behind how memories are encoded, is that there's some sort of gatekeeper part of the brain that's required to make sense of the, the information as you learn. So the hippocampus, for example, is absolutely required to make new memories um, as well. And But the ultimate site of storage of the information could be somewhere else. So in the hippocampus, for example, there's again, a, a sort of a window of about three to four weeks where you absolutely need the hippocampus to consolidate that information into long-term memory. But if you come back and lesion the hippocampus a few years later, those old memories are intact. And we know this from actual human patients that have unfortunately had, you know, hippocamp their hippocampi re removed because of seizures or, or whatnot. Um, and so they're incapable of making new memories in the, in the present, but those old, old memories are intact. And so it could be the same here. So they, they, that's how, and they speculate this in the paper that perhaps the piriform cortex is acting kind of like a hippocampal gatekeeper and that it's not the ultimate site of the storage of the representation or the information. But that still begs the question, well, when we were, then where is it? Because we, we, for the hippocampal kind of uh, the classic episodic memories that we associate uh, in, with human experience, we think that it's somewhere in the cortex. It must be somewhere in the cortex that that information is stored um, because you can lesion the hippocampus and take out the hippocampus and it's all good. Um, so yeah, so, and for me, actually in my lab, we're fascinated by, at both at the molecular and, and cellular level of what is that ultimate site of storage? What are, what are the um, actual proteins and genes that are involved in, in doing that? But there's been a lot of, um, there's still sort of a lot of unknowns here of where exactly we should be looking um, in the brain. And and yeah, so kind of crazy. Do you, think, do you think that using the word site of storage or like where we need to look in the brain is actually um, like semantically misleading? Like, do you think that when we say like where it is stored, it's really more like how and when it is stored in that like the site of storage is really like, um, like a pattern of activation that occurs over space, but like in a much larger space than we think we're like, oh, like here's the right here is like the little group of neurons that remember bananas or something. When it in could, reality, it, it's like much larger and it has more to do with like, right. um, the, you know. Yes and no. I mean, I so, um, you know, there's sort of, again, been some recent um, technological breakthroughs where you can try and tag the specific cells that are active during the learning experience and then come back and do things to them, like reactivate them without the actual sensory information and then see if that's sufficient to motivate the animal to do something so that it looks like it's remembered. So it's almost like an inception kind of, um, mm -hmm. and that's, and that's actually something that we could discuss. Um, and, and so there's this, what's called the engram, which is the idea that there's a set of neurons that are um, necessary and sufficient for that memory. And so you can do that uh, in mice and there's some, um, and, and in the hippocampus, there's a specific kind of uh, memories that you can, do this where you reactivate specific 
set of neurons that you tag during learning and then the animal thinks that it's being shocked or that thinks that it's in a context that it used to be shocked. Um, so we've sort of narrowed it down to maybe there are a specific set of neurons um, that are important for storing that information. And then the next level to that is, well, how are they connected? So those synapses and each neuron obviously has lots of, you know, lots of synapses, thousands of synapses. Um, and so is the, is it the specific set of synapses that are strengthened between those neurons that form the engram? And that's the classic synaptic plasticity hypothesis. Um, and so then that would suggest that there is a physical trace and it's the physical changes in those synapses and that's it. Um, but ultimately what the, uh, you know, what we don't know is that, um, the actual sort of firing patterns that are generated, uh, in these experiments that we use are very artificial. And, um, and then for this kind of experiment where we're just recording from the animal, um, what kind of firing patterns are really representing the information? And that's where it gets really tricky, um, because they do have, they actually state in this paper, which is sort of buried in the discussion, that there's a subset of neurons, like two, two to three percent of the neurons, that actually do have a stable representation. And but what they're saying is like, well, but if only three percent of the neurons we're recording, we recorded from, had this stable representation, that can't be enough. But maybe it is. We don't know. I mean, the, the problem with all of this is that most likely the information is very sparsely distributed. Um, and so then if you, then you have this sampling bias, right? So you don't have, if you could recall from every single neuron in the brain at the same time, then you could figure out, oh, there's these sets of neurons here that are somehow special and, and are stable across the lifetime of the animal. But those are, you know, super hard experiments. But for all intents and purposes, it does seem like with this drift, going on um that it's um it's not as the brain is not as stable as we thought or at least it's not as stable in this very as you point out sort of semantic way of saying well there must be um specific spatial information you know neurons that are in a spatial connection together to to form or at this, least uh, not for all types of information right because like yeah. you said those inception engram kind of experiments that's a particular type of information that's being encoded but it is just a fraction of the information that we could be encoding yeah exactly and the other sensory systems like the visual system is um there seems to be less drift if you record from visual cortex there's a lot more stereotyped information that you can get out of there, at least at sort of the basic level that's equivalent to an individual smell. So, you know, and these are experiments that went back uh, to human weasel where they were showing these black and white uh, bars that are moving around um, to cats and primates. Um, so the, the kind of sensory information um, that's coming in can, could be processed slightly differently. They'll, Definitely the olfactory system seems to be sort of the outlier a little bit in that it's it, it has this very stereotype um, start to the anatomy, but then some then essentially becomes random, whereas the visual system, it's stereotyped all the way through each uh, level. So, yeah, yeah. differences there. I mean, yeah. is, is there some advantage to that as and why it would be unique compared to other parts of the brain? Yeah, I mean the parameter space for smells is, is so immense, and so but it, but that's kind of dictated by also the number of receptors that uh, are encoding these these um, olfactory re receptors, and that varies from species to species, which makes sense, right? So like humans actually have way less numbers of genes, olfactory genes, than um, than mice and rodents, and rodents because they use their um, uh, sense of smell in a much more dramatic way for behavior. So that's, of course, the other caveat here is that there's going to be slight differences in anatomy and processing uh, based on species and, and their sort of evolutionary niche. But, um, but yeah, so, and humans probably one would, one could say, you, you know, our sense of smell is probably the worst <laughs> sense that we have in terms of acuity. Um, but also um, one thing to, that might play into this is that um, for visual stimulus, um, a lot of the natural stimulus that we see are 
kind of do have these features like, you know, straight lines and edges that might... Contrast. Something that contrast. Does, not, does not really ex- exist in olfaction. Can Probably you? not. Yeah. Uh, hmm. It would be like sudden appearance of some weird smell, right? That yeah. would be contrast. Yeah. But, it, but like spatial contrast is very um, unlikely to occur, I guess. But like maybe that's why like in visual, in the visual space, um, in visual cortex, there might be better, um, uh, less drift because you keep seeing, you keep seeing these um, uh, edges over and over again in your daily experience. Um, and that might help keep things in check. But there's also like, as Jason said, there's also anatomy connection um, from the thalamus to the visual cortex that keeps things kind of constrained that doesn't seem to occur for the olfactory. Yeah. Um, yeah. No, I think, I think that's true. I think the, the visual world, the information is, is a lot more stereotyped no matter where you are in the world, unless you live in the ocean um, versus smells, which, you know, are really can be quite unique to the specific, you know, tree that you're living on um, or, you know, your ecological niche. So I think the diversity of olfactory, olfactory information is, is, is a lot the parameter space is huge. I think the one, the one thing that fascinates me about the smells, about smells is that we clearly have innate smells that, or responses to smells that we all could, can relate to, right? Like none of us, as far as I know, I've never met someone who likes the smell of, you know, dog poop, for example, right? Um, and so Except there are... Dogs. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's true. Dogs, well, anyway. Um <laughs> No humans will like their, their <laughs> pets' poops. Um, so there's, you know, so there's smells and there's the smell of vomit, the smell of, you know, rotting things. Those are all innate sort of built-in responses and it's not clear, you know, how that works. And so there's clearly other circuits that are built in there where you, you, you'd you expect that the stable, there has to be a stable circuit or representation or stereotyped way of interpreting that information to get the same response in, in, every, in every individual. Um, so, so that's fascinating. Um, they should do those experiments. What odors did they use here? Um, yeah, they, I, actually, I can't. They, they specifically said they chose neutral odors. So not yep. to, so as to not engage uh, all the innate. Yeah. So, yeah. So we've got this, there's a whole, like, there's other papers that will stem off of this. I imagine looking, looking at like what Jason was just saying, or even more pleasurable ones. Right. Right. Well. Exactly. The converse like, well, um, you know, to, I guess every, you know, most animals will like, do like sugary or sugary kind of smells because that makes sense that they need to uh, try and find those the, the food that they're after. Um, so okay. then just the last thing in, in this paper oh, that they... Actually, yeah, go. Sorry, Jason. I might be anticipating the last thing in the paper, but um, one question uh, one might have is, you know how if you like just, if you really have to go and you go to a public bathroom, restroom, as soon as you walk in, you're going to get hit by a strong smell. Um, but if you stay there for a little while, you no, sometimes nice. you get used to it. You habituate. You, you like you actually you can take a big sniff and you just don't smell it anymore. And that's on the order of like maybe five to ten minutes. Um, what if something like that also also happen in the brain, but over a much longer time scale, like you know, tw- two weeks, four weeks? Yeah, so that that's um, that classic habituation to sensory information is you know, you know it's something that every brain does. Everything you know, and most sensory but, modalities too. And all sensory modalities, because otherwise you'd just go insane. But not for, but, but not for like things. Maybe for brightness, but not for an angle. You don't get used to an angle and stop being able to see it, right? Uh, that's that's true. Um, yeah. I feel like you're that I feel like that is one step below in the hierarchy of like of things. the mm-hmm. I don't know how to describe what I'm saying, but um yeah, that is uh But actually what even uh, what I said is is wrong because the prediction is that if I stop being able to smell a particular smell, um then the drift in terms of the representational drift in the cortex, it would not drift away from my original kind of um uh representation like it would not drift away from our original sets of neurons that are firing instead all those neurons should just tone down 
if you see what I mean. Like everyone should just quiet down within that set. Yeah. Um, so we will not drift in, from an angle kind so of. So that's, that's what I was going to say about what we know about habituation and all the, and sort of most of these uh, sensory uh, formats is that that habituation happens downstream of the sort of initial interpretation of the information. It's more about attention or just some sort of top down control mm -hmm. of the information to say, okay, this the brain's no like, I, I shouldn't care about this anymore. Yeah. Because there are some things that don't stop smelling. <laughs> 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 like we had a, uh, we woke up one day, we went into our pantry and it smelled like something had died <laughs> and it just didn't stop smelling like something had died. <laughs> Even if you stood in there for a long time, you could, would continue smelling it. And, um, you know, potentially that's because, uh, you know, in caveman times, that would have been a very salient thing to know that there was something dead around here and whatever killed it might come get you. Um, so yeah, it's salience yeah. and the top-down control yeah. is definitely going to decide what continues to be perceived right. and what does not. I, I um, hope you found the source of whatever that was. I did. I think it was an egg. <laughs> That okay. it was not a we I, I was like I was like something died in here and it actually was a, a hard boiled egg that my daughter had forgotten in her lunchbox and then we had put back into the pantry so um it was terrible well so on that similar note um <laughs> what they did find was that uh the only thing that seemed to sort of slow down this drift was repeated exposure to the same smell every day for, you know, the whole month that they recorded from. And in that case, um, the sort of experience, um, you know, it slowed down the drift, but it didn't completely stop it. So there's something happened there where maybe it took a few more days for the, the drift to completely, you know, go away from the initial um, firing pattern, but at least there was something there. And so, um, you know, this ex continual experience or continual um, uh, stimulus presentation was really the only thing that they could see that changed that drift. What was the effect size on that? Like you said, a couple of days. Is that? Yeah, exactly. So like. So it was really mar marginal. Yeah. I mean, it's, it, you know, it, 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 it marginal in the, in the, in the fact that, you know, it's not very stable, but sort of from a statistics point of view, it was quite a big effect, but, right. <laughs> um, you know, the drift was yeah. going from point, I guess, you know, if they normalize it to one, it was 0. 0.4, um, in a familiar, uh, smell. So, you know, 60% mm -hmm. mm -hmm. slowing. Is it, is it yeah, okay. a, of interest or possible to map the locations where the, the, the older memory goes elsewhere in the brain? Can, can that be done? Yeah, and that's, I think, the next step here is sort of to try and figure out where, what are the other um, sort of areas of the brain that are important for uh, receiving the similar information. There's, of course, also um, piriform cortex can project to other parts of the cortex. Um, and so then they're saying, well, you know, maybe there's another part of the cortex that's getting that sort of processed information through the piriform cortex. Um, uh, and that, those are sort of future experiments to try and figure out. Um, and there's also, you know, other ways to do this. So there's now uh, imaging techniques where you can, where the, the advantage there is that you are a lot more sure that you're recording from the same cell each time. And you also have spatial and more spatial information. So you could say, okay, well, he has a clump of neurons that we recorded from over there that um, seem to be special in some way because they, they don't change. Uh, and so there's been experiments that have kind of done that. Um, again, in mice, there's also been experiments even looking at uh, synapses and, and the structures of these synapses and how much stability there is in terms of their structure do they you know hang out and hang around is there um some sort of commonality there and it's the same thing it's um there's definitely a lot more plasticity and drift than um even in the structure of those connections than we originally thought uh it, even 20 years ago it was sort of thought that you know that once you have an adult circuit and adult brain it doesn't change that much and we don't you know, in the structure from a structure point of view, it doesn't do any you know good to look at the, uh, the those changes because it's just going to be the same. And then we actually looked, and we're like, oh, well, if anything, now we can't find structures that are pers that persist as long 
as the memory. Uh, and so how is this information really stored? <laughs> mm-hmm. Was there, did they look at like the, um, I don't know if this is the right word, the like kinetics of the drift, like, was it kind of a similar rate of change throughout the whole month or was it like peaked in the, at the beginning and then slowed down or the reverse trying to think of like, is there anything that they can glean from the timing that would help them direct or would help direct their attention toward like molecular things that are happening in the cells? They seem to say it's like an exponential decline in the. So it's okay. So like the, the largest shift, is going to happen early, At the early beginning, in that month. Yeah, it seems to be, and it stabilizes. Otherwise, you're gonna, you might drift mm. back to the original, and that would be really confusing. Would that be? A, would that be a problem? Who knows? Yeah, I don't. Yeah, I. It probably won't drift back to the original because there are so many neurons. But, right. Yeah. The chances of that are very low. Yeah, and we're glossing over sort of the the detailed nuances here of how they analyze the data, and they did, they did pretty comprehensive, systematic, you know, breakdown of how. It, how, how this, the recordings were made and that sort of thing. But yeah, from what, from what they could see, it didn't look like there was sort of a very, that there was an interesting pattern to the drift at all, that it was sort of, yeah, a, a process that once it started, it was very stereotyped. Mm-hmm. But. Mm. Yeah. One thing about this whole experiment is that it is, um, of course, completely correlational. Um, they are measuring neuronal activity um, so I wonder what happens if, so uh, you were mentioning um, about, you know, people are now using n-gram tagging experiments to, you know, take a snapshot, you know, at this time, I want to remember this set of neurons that's been active and I want to, you know, get them to do something. Uh, for example, express channel adoption so we can later on activate them. So I wonder if, you know, on day one, you give the mice banana smell and you record which neurons are active and then you let that drift after 30 days. And then, but on day one, you tag the neurons that are active by banana. And then on day 30, you reactivate the banana, the day one banana uh, neurons. Um, do the mice think they just smelled banana or do they think it's completely something Yeah, completely different? Um, no, exactly. And so I, I actually Richard Axel's group at Columbia have done some of the experiments. Now, I can't remember though if, if, if they lo- they waited that long um, once after the tagging, you know, so like tag them and then wait a month and then do that, that experiment. But they've certainly shown that if you ta- do tag, um, you know, using those immediate early gene neuronal activity dependent genes um, that they can get that population that's active during the initial um, encoding of the information and then they can reactivate them and they can with channel rhodopsin and and they can even associate different kinds of um, you know like they can shine a light into the cortex instead of sh- um, instead of a smell essentially you could bypass the whole sensory system and and um, asso- making an association with the shock or a context just by activating those random sets of neurons in the co- peripheral cortex. So, yeah, I mean, there is a disconnect here. I think there's, um, in terms of trying to understand, um, you know, how these engrams work. And, and I think part of the problem with the tagging approach is that you probably have way more cells that you tag initially than are actually important for the the engram. And so it works because you get enough cells that ultimately are um, important for that engram. And I think that sort of the, knowing exactly what the engram is, is where it becomes really difficult to interpret. Have you guys seen, um, there, are, there are now these fancy technology where you can actually um, use um, holographic uh, laser holographic patterning of optogenetic stimulation to actually stimulate just a few neurons, perhaps at the right time to recapitulate the exact kind of firing. Um, so I don't know, maybe that kind of yeah. science fiction stuff will um, be used in the future. Yeah, but that's too crazy uh, to think about. Well, I think that I mean, ultimately, exactly. So if inception would to be able to incept a memory into a human brain we would really have to know a priori, like beforehand, what are the neurons in that human brain that would represent 
that particular experience. And we, there's no way we could do that at this point. There's no way that we, because the only way we can do this is by artificially tagging the, the set of neurons while they experience something. And we could change the properties of that memory by artificially playing around with it. But ultimately, it's still not inception because we have to tag them in some way. And the only way to do that naturally is, is to have experience, have the mouse experience something first. Um, and so even, then it, even then, you're not getting the same neuron because it's going to drift. Yeah, yeah, but you know, I think the question then is, what is the the firing patterns that are important for for maintaining that information as well? Um, but what if, what if um, I think Ed Young kind of alludes to this in his um, in his article? Um, what if memory? So, like, what if in the sensory receptors and the thing that are very close to our five or six senses? I don't know how many senses there are. Um, I then think it's it, five. So, but how about the six? Because right, six, the one six that tens. to see the dead people yeah. is different. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, but what if the the sense the you know the receptors and the first neurons that connect to those receptors are very stereotyped and patterned, uh, stereotypic patterned. But then everything else, like memory, um, involving memory, are exactly that. Like memory are always faulty, uh, almost always faulty, and you don't remember the same memory twice because you also change in between that time. So maybe some of these drifts just represent that. And the mystery is how come each time, you know, you... Well, the thing that still needs to be explained, explained is how come each time you, you know, give me a banana, I still, even though things are drifting and my memory is faulty, I can still able to report it as a banana. Right. Yeah, no, I mean, that's a really good point in terms of memory. So, you know, um, we individually think our memories, our strong memories are, are very accurate, but they're completely um, false. And by the time that you... Um, recall a memory you know more than a couple of times it's been updated in a way the memory that, of a memory yeah i mean it's Meta. well but it's the recall it says updated each time and so then uh it's slightly different it drifts there is drift in our memories and that is very uh, clear um from from all kinds of studies but what is surprising about this result is as you say that the idea of a banana if you have a good sense of smell is not going to change uh, over years. Like you, you send, you, you smell a banana the first time and the hundredth time it's the same. So that's where it's surprising that there's not a stable representation of that sensory information um, in the cortex memories. I can understand because to some degree, each time you recall that memory, it gets updated. Um, and there's sort of a, a context of, uh, of information that, that goes with that memory. Um, and so that's, and that's also why, you know, for most of us, we don't have photographic memories. And so we're not going to be able to just say, oh, you, know, you know, on the, this time and this day, this is what I did. How much does it, uh, I have a couple of things I want to say, but one is how, how confident are we in slash how strongly does this, uh, is this updating of memories? Like, and what does that actually look like? Have people shown that like, translated that into an actual like change in firing pattern, changes in protein expression, changes in synaptic strength or something like that. Because I, my initial reaction is to be very cautious about saying that like, you know, I recall a memory and then like I'll, or I make a memory, I recall it. And then the second time I rec recall it, I have like a different experience while recalling it. Like I see certain things more, um, more strongly, or like I focus in on a particular feeling I had during that memory that maybe I didn't experience during my first recall, I would be cautious to take that and say that it is related to, dependent on, or driving this, the drift that they're talking about in this paper. Could be any one of those things, could be none of them. I don't know, but I would just, um, like, I perp when like, mm, I don't know if those are actually the same things. Yeah. I mean, when, when, when the sort of phenomenon first sort of, uh, so in memory, there's in the field, uh, there's this idea of consolidation, right? And so you, you're, um, if you interfere with that consolidation process it, it, during that window, you can stop the, the uh, you know, long-term memory formation. And, uh, but at some point there, it's stable enough that you can't interfere with it. And that, and that means interfering it both at a protein or molecular level also, but also from a sort of behavioral level. Um, you know, like 
that's why it's harder for you to uh, memorize a phone number if I tell you to, you know, also think about what you ate for breakfast at the same time. You just, you know, you're going to be able to, you won't be able to do both. Well, most people. <laughs> unless you, unless you use those techniques, um, the memory palace. Yeah, to connect them. Yeah. But, um, but so, uh, when the, so this idea of, of uh, plasticity of you know like there's a window of that you can interfere with the memory at the molecular level was clear and one of the things that you can do is you can block protein synthesis so you need new proteins to be made um, for this consolidation process and that that's transfer that, that, that that's the case for almost every single kind of long term memory uh, study so then but then what people started to see was that you if you when you test the animal. To, to ask them if they can recall that information, um, that memory becomes labile again in that it's now, uh, now if you put another uh, round of protein synthesis inhibitors, it, f- it blocks the consolidation. So they oh, basically, okay. uh, and so then, the, and so this was called reconsolidation. Um, and it was very controversial in the beginning because as you said, it was like, well, we just thought it was all fixed and then how can you suddenly update it? Um but that that's also actually be behind uh, an idea behind some of the latest therapies that uh, that are, um, even at the behavior level for PTSD. So you know w- there we think PTSD, of course, is these um, really strong memories that have a super strong emotional content that um, and you have very little control over that emotional content and the, and control over what triggers it. So to get rid of that sort of d- connection between the emotional content and the memory, um, if you react, if you, if you get people to recall these experiences, these traumatic experiences in a safe environment in a, you know, in a, uh, with a professional. And um, part of the reason why this, this works is that, uh, it's because you're updating that memory and you're, you're trying to get rid of the emotional content. Um, and, and then even to the point where um, there's some drugs on that have been used or like beta blockers, you may have heard of that you could try and use beta blockers to, um, to, to get rid of these abnormal memories. It's the same kind of thing where we think when you ask someone to recall the information, now there's some sort of reactivation of the engram um, and you can interfere with the reconsolidation of it with a with a drug. Um, so I think there's so you know um, exactly how all of that works in, in in relation to the sensory drift that they're seeing here, the drift that is not clear. Um, but it, it, I think it's just this sort of the bottom line is that our brains are a lot more plastic and, and unstable than we thought. <laughs> yeah, this is reminding me of something actually. What you were just saying is reminding me of an, another New York Times article. Um, the title is "Many People Have a Vivid Mind's Eye, While Others Have None at All." And I wonder if there are people who um, are naturally, be, how to say this, um, they can revisit memories to a stronger extent than others, and so that they, whatever they may have, mechanisms for plasticity that are more robust than people who don't have as much of a mind's eye and who can't like fully immerse themselves in a memory. I think we should, that, I think we should actually discuss that, that, uh, that those res- that paper and th- those do you know, results. Do you yeah, know what I mean, it, you know of it? I, yeah, <laughs> I, I mean, only well, read the- I mean, it's mind blowing. So, right. So it's basically you suddenly you ask people, uh, do you, you know, do you, how do you think, do you think in, in can you recall in images mm-hmm. and, I'm like, how can you not think in images? And there are some people that say some people don't, don't. Think in images. And you're like, mm-hmm. wait, that's so fundamental to human experience. Mm-hmm. And now we're finding that people can act, that have such a have such a baseline difference in how they think. You know, like, yeah, no and, wonder we can't understand each other. <laughs> and it's not even just uh, th- like this. That article is talking about um, you know using. Uh, imagery or like visualizing something recalling with images, but I think it's also related to, um, you know, uh, inner voice. I and mean, we, I may have mentioned this before in another one of our episodes, but, um, that some people have very strong inner voices and, and they experience that as like auditory, um, that is an auditory experience. Like they're talking to themselves or they have conversations with people. They're, you know, imagining a conversation with somebody, so um, 
you know, do people who have a strong inner voice have a strong mind's eye? And what does that mean biochemically, you know, in their neurons and how their brains function? Like, are they more, are they going to be uh, more creative because their plas- their plasticity toolbox is uh, more robust or, you know, it's just, it's very interesting. There was another thing I wanted to say. Um, I'm fascinated in the, um, vision field about, um, categorizing stimuli. Like if, um, there's a guy at Georgetown who studies this about like, he'll have a a picture of a car and it will slowly change its shape until it becomes a truck. And they, like, if you look at the truck and you look at the car, like they're very different and you would categorize this one as a car and this one as a truck. And they're trying to determine like, when has there been enough change or enough drift in the stimulus that you can categorize it as something else and you can draw the distinction. And um, I was just wondering if um, smell has, does a similar thing. Cause like you can kind of imagine how with, for um, like sensory, your proprios or not proprios, somatic sensation, you can tell when something be- goes from being like soft touch to hard touch, you know, it's act because it's activating different neurons, different types of um, receptors. But um, does smell operate in the same way? And then how would that interact with this, these kind of like, you know, some systems being very stable, the visual system being very stable and potentially yeah. and less stability in olfaction. My my neighbor here in Utah, Matt Wachowiak, is one of the experts on on this. I should ask him that. I but I think the smell it's 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 a combination of concentration. So is there enough of the odorant to activate the receptor? And then it's and then and then of course it's how many other odorants that are at a high concentrations that are hanging around at the same time that could mask or combine with with each other to form a sort of different kind of representation. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's that's where these experiments are somewhat artificial in that they're very controlled concentration of odor and they're single odors, and that's not normally what you would find. You know, right. Because you're going to um, smell that banana as a banana or maybe banana bread. <laughs> or yeah. you know, well, but even a banana. Like, like there's, there's, a, you know, there's probably one or two different odorants that make up the banana smell, not just one uh, as a combination. Right, and I wonder that when they do the experiment, what were they exposed? You said it was daily exposure to the same odorant. What if they like, you know, cause the if they, uh, you know, change very sm- in a very small way the banana smell. I don't know how you do that, but I mean, probably like what you're saying, they mix different things together, like a certain ratio. If that would, if you could to a certain point, like keep the drift low and know that like be- below that threshold, the banana smell is still banana, is still being interpreted as a ban- <laughs> as banana smell. And then past that yeah. point, you've, you know, it's like the car versus the truck. You've passed some level. I don't know like why you would care about that, but um, I just think it's very interesting when you, when we're talking about the, the different sensory modalities to think about how those stimuli are different. Like your brain has, a, you, you know, your, your somatosensory cortex has, is very, uh, is, it has a map on it, right? So that certain body parts are always going to be represented in certain places and your visual field, your um, visual cortex is the same way because you have a visual field that you separate into quadrants, right? And know that where stuff comes from. Um, and same with your, with, um, your hearing your, but smell seems a little bit more, um, convoluted. Like there's no real like map. Yeah. And then that's because the the parameter space is so much. So like, you know, there's millions of smells, but there's only a couple of hundred receptors that can detect, uh, them. So in humans, our repertoire of smells is much less than of course, in an animal that's going to have like a thousand receptors that could detect a lot more different parameters. But I think you can, you can still class them into like, for example, uh, an, an orange might smell more similar to a lemon than it does to, um, I don't know, a rose, for example. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And that's probably, so, you know, yeah, because of similar odorants. Yeah. So I wonder, I think they might have looked at it in the paper. I just don't remember getting that deep into it. Like whether if you measure how similar, if you give a mouse on day zero, both orange and lemon, 
um, mm. because they're similar. Mm-hmm. And then you look at how orange drifted by, you know, 30 days. Can you use that to predict, predict where the lemon has drifted to? Like, do they all drift similarly? Um, I think they found, they, they did some, they did that geometry uh, figure. Um, yeah, I think it's not quite so simple as that. But um, yeah, I think it, things basically got much more jumbled up than being able to predict things. Yeah. Right, right, exactly. Yeah, by the end of the, the month recording, they couldn't tell which one was which, basically. All right. Uh, before we close, we can close pretty quickly, but I just wanted to do a couple of email to make a little inroads, maybe uh, just two or so. Yeah. Uh, the first one is actually related, in a way, this is from Dave, who writes, a comment was made, and I don't remember when, if an olfactory neuron was destroyed, it wouldn't regenerate. Although this is often true, olfactory neurons can and do regenerate, even following transection. And he, he gives a link to a paper uh, on mice, but it's also been established in humans. This is a paper uh, on regeneration and rewiring the olfactory bulb. I've always thought that since chemoreception has been evolving longest of the senses, suggesting a simpler structure with more time for incremental upgrades, that repair after injury has developed more than other senses. Any thoughts on that? Well, I mean, it, it actually is true that um, there's only two, two major parts of the brain that have neurogenesis and make, making new neurons after development. So one of them is the hippocampus and the other one is the olfactory bulb. Well, um, really. It, hmm, there might be something. That's interesting other that region. you say that. Are you talking about, uh, <laughs> I, I, did you meet the SVZ <laughs> or... Because like the neurogenesis that the the cells that are being I, this I don't know this I'm yeah I mean expert, ultimately but. they they migrate you're right so they 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 migrate to um, the olfactory bulb but basically the idea is that you can replenish those those uh, neurons in the olfactory bulb you know as an adult um, but none of the other sensory systems have that either and built in and I I think I've asked Matt that question of why you would want to have you know, this regeneration, and it's not clear. It's exposed well, all the time. <laughs> um, <laughs> all these flu and coronaviruses. And, you know, fingernail, no, no not, not oh, fingernails. Yeah. It's, that's way further up there. Um, I was going to ask, though, so uh, I don't know know this, but I was like, maybe there is, when Jason was like, in the olfactory, I was like, is there like local neurogenesis happening? Because, um, and I'm just starting to learn about olfactory bulb, like neurogenesis for olfactory bulb neurons, because it's associated with the work I'm doing with microglia and early postnatal development. Um, and we're looking at the SVZ. Um, but the neurons that are dying in the olfactory bulb are they're not like the in, are they the inhibitory interneurons that are being born from the SVZ postnatally and that are migrating? It's those ones. It's not like okay, okay. Yeah, yes, I wasn't sure because are they exposed? Inhibitory interneurons, but I don't know. Where, yeah, I don't know. I don't know what the, the details right. are there, but <laughs> something to look up. It will be. We'll follow up on it on a, in a future episode. <laughs> and actually, to quickly add to the factory bulb, um, the, I don't know whether you guys remembered in the news last year they found uh, they found humans uh, that can still smell even though they don't have olfactory bulbs. So this actually suggests that olfactory bulbs is not necessary for smell, uh, and it's a complete mystery. <laughs> well, is it, I, I mean, there is this whole pheromone circuit that animals have, right? Mm. And th- they seem to bypass a lot of the circuitry in the olfactory bulb. Um, it's always thought that humans don't have a lot of those pheromone circuits intact because we've sort of evolved out of them. But there's always, always occasionally an experiment or study that. show that, that, um, that you, yeah, that, that, that they're intact in some people. So I don't know. And are these people, uh, Tim, were they people who were like, uh, lost their olfactory bulb during injury or was it congenitally? I don't, I think it's congenital. Um, but how do that, you know that they, ex- how do you know that they're smelling? Like, they, could, they be, sure. ex- could they be uh, experiencing something that they call smell that is intact? Ah. Uh, it's difficult to tell. So I haven't read the paper. Um, ah. I'm just quickly reading the abstract, but they can, I'm guessing they ran a bunch of discrimination tests and they can tell them apart. Um, but like whether a banana smells as banana-y 
to these people with our olfactory bulb as it does to us. Well, well, I'd like you know, to... Ultimately, I don't know if you experience red the same way as I do either. It's yeah, a subjective that's nature. What, but. That's what I was going to bring up. I mean, <laughs> what they really need to do really would just be like tape the person's mouth shut so that they couldn't be receiving the odorant through another organ that is maybe capable of processing that information, right? Like you're probably not smelling smelling stuff through your eyes or your ears, right? Maybe except for mouth. except for chili pepper and uh, wasabi and mustard through your eyes. I don't know. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. that could be your tongue, but, right? Yeah, and That's onions. Hmm. Um, let's do one more. Uh, Vivian, can you take the next one? Sure. Um, hold on. Probably you don't have your show notes open. But... I, I do have it up. Okay. Uh, okay, but I have to see where. It's another day. Well, it's the same day. Yeah. Was it the um, one of the listeners asked yeah. in effect yeah, if yeah. mice lie? Why use them? Yep. All right. Okay. Here is. Would you like me to read the question? Yep. I'm reminded of a time when I approached my PI with a modification that would collect the same amount of data in one day that we were currently gathering in one week. He explained that the procedure we were using was well established in the literature. My suggestion might very well be an improvement, but it wouldn't um, be acceptable for publication unless we demonstrated that it did not introduce unintended consequences, such as altering the protein conformation that we were studying. Since our lab ran this procedure once or maybe twice a year, it wouldn't make sense to spend the months required to demonstrate that the new procedure gave the same results as the old procedure, only faster. Mice have been in the literature so long, much has been done with mice, pure genetic strains, knockout strains, et cetera, that there would have been a compelling reason to use other animals. That there would have been, okay. In fact, these reasons often come up enough that other animals are also common residents of research labs. Dogs, pigs, ferrets, non-human primates are all widely studied. But mice are small. They're easy to handle, don't require much food, breed prodigiously, are none too prone to infanticide, are trainable, but also have innate behaviors that can be used to measure perception. If we were going to stock our Mars colony with an animal for genetic research, we might very well still choose mice because they score highly on so many different criteria. I like that story. This is to answer the, but done in mice. uh, Yeah, why are mice so commonly used? Yeah. 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 But there is a push, there is a push to sort of diversify our model organisms. And, um, you know, I think we can learn a lot by studying other organisms. So it just depends on the question. As I, there's no wrong model organism. It depends on the question you're trying to answer. Like if, if you're trying to answer a vision question in a blind mole, then yeah, then that would be not be a good idea. Well, it depends, right? If you wanted to try to recreate a visual system in the absence of eyes, for yeah. example. True. But, um, yeah, and that first story about the PI saying like we can't it, you cannot you cannot stray far from what has been already been done unless you want that to be your primary question. Your primary question being like I want to show that this method can be is equivalent to this other one. I've definitely run across that just recently uh with something that I'm doing where um we we keep coming keep saying like well, why don't we do it this way and um our supervisor says because this other these people did it this way, and that's the way we're going to do it. And um, and I ultimately think that that is that is the best approach right now because as we know that there are so many problems with reproducibility, even the tiniest differences in approach can have you know acu- accumulate big effects on the results and the conclusions. So, there are many, many studies, for um, example, of using. Two labs using the same mice, everything's exactly the same, get different results. Turns out, you know, person is wearing some cologne in one ma- in one lab and it yeah. right. changes right. everything, right? Um, what is the kind of, um, Jason, you were saying that we should diversify our pool of uh, animal models. But like, so what do we have now? We have uh, various types of rodents, fish, drosophila, like, I'm sure there are others. Worms. But how... Worms. Yeah, worms. <laughs> yeah, well, there's this idea that if you explore the, pra- the you know, what has the evolution done in all these different uh, organisms? So, um, you know, CRISPR came out of studying bacterial defenses. And so the problem is that is that if you 
just concentrate on a few animals, you may be missing all this other amazing biology that could illuminate, you know, things that we just have no idea um, they would be useful for. But on the other hand, there's also just questions that are uniquely suited for those animals. So like, you know, there's now some push to study. Um, well, I'll give one exa quick example where uh, Joe Parker at Cal Caltech is studying these beetles that can mimic the ants that they live in. So they're parasites, essentially. They live in the ant colony. They get the ant to feed them because the ants, they fooled the ants into thinking that they're, they're a, an ant. And, and so they've evolved both in terms of their structure of their bodies, as well as what the chemicals they're producing to mimic what the ants are doing. So this is, you know, one, uh, all sorts of weird and wonderful uh, evolutionary tricks to mimic behavior to mimic smell and to mimic body morphology and it's but these are not that um these beetles are you know if you look at their sort of wild type um species uh they evolved from they're pretty pretty different <laughs> so it's and the only uh, i'm like thinking how do you apply this to humans and i'm uh, thinking well, psycho yeah, psychopathy I mean, you know psychopaths they can mimic normal people not everything has to relate directly to humans yes that is true although i would i would argue that a lot of people tend to fall into that you know thinking like well what's the point unless it illuminates something about us i mean as a basic scientist i'm just interested in knowing how stuff works i don't care if it what organism you're talking about um, I just think it's, you know, that in and of itself is enough, but, right. um, but I, but I also think like if we, if we start, you know, maybe we have this many, my, this many animal models that we're studying and we're trying to understand like them fully understand like a deep under, get a certain depth of understanding. And if we're like, but we're also going to include all these other models, then how far can we go? We have limited time, limited financial resources, um, you know, limited people. Yeah. So are we going to be, you know, giving up some of the uh, depth of information that we have about the animal models that we were, were comfortable working with so that we can just say that we we're studying more, you know? Yeah. And I think this comes back again to the question. And so if you, if, I mean, I think the, the original question about mice and, um, studying them is, is more, as you say, directly translational to human, uh, biology. So, you know, why are m mice used so much? And then you test a drug in a mouse and it cures the X disease and then it doesn't in a human. So that's a direct translational issue versus mm -hmm. we need to understand how, you know, synapses work in multiple different organisms to get a, an idea of what's really core to function. And who knows if that's going to help with a disease. Um, you know, and looking at weird sequences and bacteria, no one thought at that point that that was going to solve gene editing. <laughs> so I, I just think that, you know, and then again, that's a basic science PR problem where it's hard for, for us to tell uh, the public why we're studying a, 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 some sequence in a bacteria and how that's going to relate to uh, human disease. But, but now we, we're accumulating these examples where, we just don't know enough about these systems to predict where the big breakthroughs may come from. So, right, the serendipity the of science. Of yep. Science. It's uh, it's hard to get people who don't do it to get it, but it certainly has paid off many times. Just let smart yeah. people be curious, and good right. things will happen. Uh, that's twin number twenty. You can find the show notes at microbe.tv/slash twin. Uh, you can send us a question or a comment, twin, T-W-I-N, at microbe.tv. If you like what we do, consider supporting us, microbe.tv slash contribute. Jason Shepard is at the University of Utah over on Twitter, Jason Synaptic. Thanks, Jason. Thanks, Vincent. Timothy Chung is at NYU, New York University. Thanks, Timothy. Thanks, Vincent. Thanks, everyone. And Vivian Morrison is at Vanderbilt University. Thanks, Vivian. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Jason, for leading that. It was very interesting. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. It was a lot of fun. I'm Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at virology.blog. And listening to This Week in Neuroscience, thanks for joining us. We'll see you next month.